two men stood on top of a hill in front of a large plain, one of them holding a shovel and the other a flag. The Frontera family flag fluttered in the wind. The man with the shovel was named John, but everyone thought he was Royd Frontera, since he had found himself in another world and in someone else's body, and now he was going to do the incredible. The animals at their feet joyfully awaited this event. Royd swung the shovel like a sword, choosing the best spot. He stuffed the shovel into the ground, and the unexpected happened. The grass under his feet turned into cells of a virtual field, and this transformation began to spread further and further. The entire plain under their feet turned into virtual reality. Projections of high-rise buildings slowly began to appear out of thin air, and John remembered that in his previous life he was an ordinary civil engineer. He was going to change the world he found himself in by applying his knowledge, create a real metropolis instead of an empty plain. Roy turned to another man, who turned out to be his servant Gabriel. Happy that his capabilities were applicable in this world, he planned to make good money by building such a city. Gabriel, unable to see the projections of the metropolis, decided that his master had gone mad, since his joy was not justified by anything. John remembered how he woke up in Royd's body several years ago. He was awakened by a strange notification in a blue tablet that he had been chosen by some absolute and could make a wish. The second notice in the blue sign, which also did not explain anything, was with congratulations. John woke up from these notifications lying in the middle of the road. The next notice, saying that he had become one of the heroes of the novel Night of Iron and Blood, was even more strange. John, still lying on the ground, remembered that he had read this novel before he fell asleep. The next notification asked him to try harder and wished him good luck. John, who did not understand anything and was convinced that he had not drunk before, could not understand whether he was imagining it or not, and then thought in shock that maybe he had been transferred to a body from another world, as it was in the stories that he had read. He didn't really understand why he woke up when he fell to the ground and whether he was really in another world. Having risen with difficulty, the man felt a terrible cold. While trying to say the sentence, John realized that something had happened to his mouth. A new red notification appeared in front of him, informing him that due to sleeping outside, he had developed a crooked mouth. John got angry at the notification, because he already understood what was wrong with it, and sharply brushed away the pop-up window with his hand. The man rubbed his jaw, looking around and realizing that he was definitely not in his body, but in the body of some hero from the novel The Night of Iron and Blood, but still did not understand whose place he had taken, remembering which of the heroes was that person, that he lived in the village and could sleep on the road. Then a stranger called him by name, calling him Royd. It was a servant who had been looking for him for a long time. John saw first his sword, and then his light blue hair. In front of him was a tall, neat man in an aristocratic suit, advising him to return to the mansion and a sign appeared from below with an inscription that the stranger's name was Gabriel Azrahan, and he was the main character of the novel Night of Iron and Blood, which John fell into. John was surprised that the man in front of him looked exactly like the one in the novel he was reading, and he also called John Royd, which also confused him. He remembered that Gabriel, in the story of the novel, was a sword master who should become famous throughout the continent but at the very beginning he was just a knight guarding Baron Arcos Frontera. John remembered the name of Baron Frontera's eldest son. He, John, was named Royd Frunter, after the naughty tomboy son of the Baron. From shock, he didn't even realize that he had asked it out loud. Gabriel replied that he didn't call him a tomboy. However, he confirmed that John had correctly assessed his characterization, and the blue notification sign immediately popped up mockingly confirmed that Gabriel was pleased with such a remark. Together they returned to the Frontera family estate. Gabriel, lighting a fire in the fireplace in Royd's room, where John was now to live, asked why he was lying on the road. Since the frozen John did not answer anything, Gabriel himself said that Royd had been drinking since lunch, and then broke all the dishes in the tavern then, missing home, he simply fell asleep on the way, which John was not surprised, because this is what all the days of this character looked like tomboy. Gabriel said that the Baron sent him, despite his bad son, to take care of him, because Royd could have died on the street, and even with a twisted mouth, and John noticed that he spoke without fear, that the room was very cold, and John still could not warm up, and when he touched the floor, he realized that it was icy. Gabriel decided to leave Royd to rest, 
saying that tomorrow he would report to the baron about his tricks, and when he asked if the servant could not talk about his pogrom in the city, Gabriel refused. Before leaving, Royd called out to Gabriel. He wanted to know how much light there was in the house. Gabriel did not understand him, since they lived in the Middle Ages and electricity had not yet been invented. Closing the door, the servant left John alone and cold. He thought about it, because he knew all the contents of the novel. The previous evening, he had just finished reading the last chapter, and knew the fate of the hero whose body he fell into, the fate of Royd. His parents, the Baron and his wife, commit suicide at the very beginning because of the scammers who stole their fortune, and Royd starts begging and drinking nonstop. His life ends with him vomiting blood and dying. John jumped out of bed, upset by these memories and emphatically shouted that even though he managed to become an aristocrat, his life was as worthless as the one he had in Korea in his native body. He remembered the very first notification that he had been chosen by some absolute, and he could make a wish, and wondered what this unknown person was up to and why he had put him in this body. The next morning he woke up in the same place, in the house of Baron Frontera. His mother Maria Frontera learned from Gabriel that Royd had broken all the dishes in the inn the previous evening. John felt awkward because he was not doing this, but reading a novel in which he was now caught up. Maria anxiously asked Royd to go and apologize. John agreed with this and was ready to apologize for Royd, which he told Maria and Gabriel. But this behavior was completely out of character for Royd, so Maria and Gabriel looked surprised, which was confirmed by the blue sign that popped up. John is outraged that they are not proud of him for such a decision, but he quietly follows to the village to fulfill his promise. A village resident was calmly putting straw into a cart on one of the streets of the village. Soon he noticed the newcomers and became afraid. John, in Royd's body, and Gabriel were walking down the street. As soon as the man saw them, he hid. John turned around, not understanding anything. But when he looked at the other residents, everyone ran away in horror and fear as soon as they noticed him. John felt confused and looked up. The boy, who looked out the window to look at him, was immediately grabbed by his mother, and the window was closed, since the woman forbade the child to look at Royd. A pop-up blue sign said that the villagers hated Royd, which he had already guessed. Royd turned to the servant, asking why he was following him, to which Gabriel replied that it was the Baron's order, as well as an order to guard. Royd was surprised when he asked who to protect him from, to which the servant replied that his task was to protect the residents from Royd. John remembered that Royd's image was very bad, and decided that he should clean it up so that by the time he started begging, like the hero in the book, the villagers would have a better opinion of him, and would give him a piece of bread. John also remembered the debts of the Royd family, because if they had not existed, he could have lived in luxury all his life. He thought that since the signs were popping up in front of him, maybe there was some kind of cheat code, and was able to call up a blue sign with the skills of his hero. The sign said that he had only two skills, one of which was the passive skill of a non-entity and only allowed him to irritate others, and the second skill characterized him as an alcoholic, and when used, the hero became a dog. John clapped his hands angrily to brush away the sign that upset him, causing confusion in Gabriel, who had not seen the signs. The servant clarified where Royd was going. Gabriel reminded them that the inn where Royd had to apologize to the owner was to them, and asked if Royd had lied to his mother, to which John said that he was just thinking a little. The servant looked at the man skeptically. John began to act like a fool so as not to show that he did not recognize the area. Gabriel closed his eyes tiredly, inviting Royd to go into the inn. John excused himself and headed inside. Gabriel watched him carefully, mentally noting that since the previous day Royd had been acting strangely as if he had become a different person. Inside the tavern, all the furniture was broken. The decorations on the walls were also affected. John sat down at the only intact table, bowed and announced his desire to apologize for what Royd had done the previous evening. The innkeeper froze, and the blue sign that appeared said that he was on alert, not knowing what to expect from Royd. He asked Royd to stop, and John thought that his words only frightened the man further due to his bad image and too polite language. John tried to change his manner of communication and apologized in a burish manner, and then a sign popped up saying that he had used an inappropriate manner for an apologetic person. The owner hardly squeezed out the words that everything was fine and Royd need not apologize. John decided that this would be enough. She and Gabriel could return home. On the way, 
John shared with the servant that even after his apology, the innkeeper did not look happy. Gabriel explained to him that an apology was of little use, because all the dishes and furniture that Royd had broken were bought with the innkeeper's personal money, and if his master had compensated for the losses, the innkeeper would have been satisfied. John thought that even if he wanted to, he couldn't do this, because the family he fell into was in debt, which means he wouldn't be able to look normal in the eyes of the residents so easily, and he urgently needed to deal with his debts. The servant added that for the innkeeper, it is not only about money, because the winter is very cold, and the health of the innkeeper's mother is poor, and the pogrom organized by Royd only worsened the situation. John remembered how cold it was in the inn, because there was only one fireplace, which was difficult to heat the house with. As they walked, he thought about how it would be hard for old people to survive in such cold weather until someone comes up with a floor heating system in this world, and that thought made him stop. The idea that arose from random reflection in his head quickly became brilliant. John was still amazed, because the thought that passed through his mind was so simple and perfect. He was shocked by his own idea. In an instant, he was amazed at the ease of the solution that occurred to him. A virtual beam traced the space, creating a network of lines that formed the layout. John was mentally imagining the underfloor heating system that could be developed for the inn, because a heating system in a cold world, in his opinion, was a must-sell. The fool Royd, whose body he fell into, could not even dream of such thoughts. But for the real John it was possible and even feasible, since his specialty was civil engineer and he was good at it. In addition, while serving in the army, he had experience building a house alone. In his old world, he worked a lot on construction sites. John clenched his fist with enthusiasm and joy, as if the matter was decided because now he knew how and with what he could earn money in this world and cover all the debts of the family of which he had become a part. He turned towards the city, telling Gabriel that they needed to return to the inn right now, and the servant turned around with incomprehension. John was unstoppable, because he was about to get his first order. As soon as the man said this, several signs appeared in front of him one after another. The first notification announced that his real journey had begun, the second said that a system of points and relationships called RP had been activated. The third said that he could receive these points when interacting with others. And the fourth reported that now the points are at zero. John looked at these notifications with surprise and bewilderment, trying to understand what they meant and how to manage the new information. John was carefully looking at the notifications, trying to figure out what the unknown RP value meant, whether it was related to experience, and whether it could be applied somehow, when another blue information sign appeared. The inscription on the sign said that he could get RP by improving relations with other main characters. When he turned to look at Gabriel, a blue sign with a characteristic began to appear above the servant's head. The symbols on the sign indicated that Gabriel's level of interest in Royd, in whose body John ended up, was minus 30, and John decided that since the value was negative, it probably indicated a very low indicator. John felt uncomfortable and decided to turn to the usually emotionless and reserved servant in an attempt to rectify the situation. Making a charming expression on his face in an attempt to win over the servant, John complimented him, calling him handsome, and the blue information plaque immediately correctly assessed his motives, calling this action an attempt to gain Gabriel's interest. But Gabriel remained just as cold and distant, saying that he was aware and the information signs that appeared reported that Royd's compliment not only did not make a positive impression on Gabriel, but on the contrary, worsened his attitude towards Royd by one point. John, upset and disappointed, turned away from the servant and continued on his way, mentally trying to understand why his servant was so cold to him, and a simple compliment only worsened his attitude towards Royd. The guys returned to the village again, visiting the innkeeper with Royd's brilliant idea. John drew up an agreement with the innkeeper and read out its terms, pleased with how cleverly he came up with everything. He handed the contract to the man, informing him that all construction costs would be deducted from the amount of his compensation for the commotion he caused, and the innkeeper only needed to sign the document. However, when Royd looked at the man, a new blue information sign told him that the innkeeper did not trust him. John saw that the man not only didn't trust him, but was also trying to pull away using an ability called Soul Wall, which the sign told him, and the guy himself realized that he might have problems executing his plan due to the fact that no one trusted him. This upset John greatly, 
but he was not about to give up and ruin his grand plan from the very beginning, so he had to resort to the method that he least wanted to use, namely, using the characteristic of insignificance. Making a terribly disgusting expression on his face, he reminded the innkeeper that they would see each other often, and therefore they should trust each other. This made an incredible impression on the innkeeper, and he immediately hurried to sign the contract that lay in front of him in order to quickly get rid of the annoying aristocratic son, while the blue information plate described Royd as real trash. But John didn't care about this, because the result was achieved, and he received the first signed contract. So the guy was overcome with evil triumph, and he quickly hid the signed document in his pockets so that the innkeeper would not have time to change his mind. John finally decided to reassure the man, assuring him that he would not regret his action, and he made a good choice, to which Gabriel looked at his master doubtfully, but said nothing. When both men left the inn, the weather was beautiful outside. They stopped in the courtyard next to the inn, and John, with a shovel in his hands, mentally imagined how he would begin to implement his plan, and Gabriel watched him. The servant addressed Roig for the first time since they returned to the city. Gabriel's face expressed doubt, disapproval, and dissatisfaction, as did his words asking that if Roig blackmailed the innkeeper into signing a contract, then he was up to no good again and was going to harm the people around him on a new level. John looked at the servant with skepticism, trying to understand how he came to such conclusions. He asked whether Gabriel had any logic at all, since he asked such questions, and also clarified whether the servant knew what a cognitive distortion was, and he could only ask incomprehensibly about the second part of the question. John, slightly offended, explained to the assistant that the cognitive distortion is that he expects from Royd now and in the future the same things that happened in the past, and this is caused by the fact that every brain cell is a stereotype and negative thoughts. Gabriel countered that his conclusions were not based on stereotypes and negative thoughts, but on experience and statistics. John, in turn, clarified that both experience and statistics are the past, which is what he was talking about. Gabriel had nothing to answer to this, and the servant wondered again whether Royd had been able to formulate his thoughts so competently before. And while the servant was thinking about this, a new phrase about how the innkeeper's family would smile made Gabriel look away from his thoughts and turn his attention to Royd. He had already started working with a shovel, and in response to the servant's silent question, he explained that both the innkeeper and his mother would actually laugh with joy. Royd made a new movement with the shovel, thinking about how these emotions of ordinary people would change his life as well. His new movement, filled with anticipation, was associated with the thought that these smiles could become the foundation for his income. All Royd had to do was dig, move the earth, compact it, and repeat it all over again, while his servant simply watched from a short distance. After the guy dug a small foundation, he used lumber from the mansion's warehouse, single-handedly making a wooden frame for the future house. The next step was to apply river clay, preparing the body of the house, which greatly exhausted Royd's body. John lay on the ground next to the house, wet with sweat, thinking about what a weak body he had inherited. Gabriel, examining the finished frame of the house without a roof, reported that Roy did it very quickly, but John was immediately indignant because it took a whole week. The servant, looking at the tired master, thought incredulously that, apparently, he really planned to build what he promised and honor the concluded contract, and Gabriel did not expect this from Roy, who was always protesting work, who, moreover, had never done this before studied. John did not have time to monitor the servant's tossing, because he wanted to finish the construction of this house as quickly as possible, and he had no time left for rest, although his whole body was very sore and resisted the new loads associated with chopping wood. John, with great difficulty coping with fatigue, picked up an axe, intending to chop a piece of wood. His entire body trembled from work and tension as he swung his axe to strike. John gathered his strength, and with an exhalation was about to lower the axe onto the block to split it but his axe hands were suddenly stopped by Gabriel's strong hand. The servant stopped the staggering tired master, preventing him from making a blow. Gabriel took the axe from John's hands to the latter's surprise, because he did not expect any action from the servant. Gabriel, meanwhile, took Royd's place, asking what needed to be done, and the man, who did not understand what was happening, explained that he needed to get boards measuring one span horizontally and two spans vertically. The swordsman threw wooden logs in front of him, 
as if he did this on a regular basis. Then, he grabbed the axe as if in his hand there was not a tool for construction work, but a real weapon. A series of sharp, fast, professional strikes were performed by Gabriel with lightning speed and surprise. Instead of the wooden logs thrown at the top, a hail of planks of the ideal size John needed fell onto the ground. Royd was speechless and could only give a thumbs up. After all, he forgot that his servant is a sword master, and he does not need modern devices to do such a colossal job. Royd approached Gabriel, having plans for his servant. He stood with a shovel and asked if Gabriel, since he had mastered the tree so quickly, would like to help him with the digging. The servant was confused and upset that Royd did not even thank him for his help, but on the contrary, forced him to continue working. But then he realized that he simply forgot about the harmful nature of his master, and the blue information sign conveyed that the servant regretted helping. However, John was not going to limit himself to just one question, and approaching the servant, he began to put pressure on his sense of justice, saying that Gabriel helped him out of interest, so that Royd would not be able to deceive anyone, and the servant would be curious to see the result. And since this so, then both of them should work to quickly complete what they started and assuage the swordsman's doubts. And John, once again putting pressure on Gabriel's feelings, said that they should work together so that the servant could quickly figure out his insidious plan. Gabriel had no choice but to agree, without asking questions and leaving his master's remarks without comment, because he agreed with Royd's words mentally, realizing that for several days his master had been completely different, even though the servant could not trust him because of Royd's past. Therefore, Gabriel began to work along with Royd, because only after completing the construction would he be able to check what his master's insidious plan was. Gabriel gave it his all, wielding a shovel and digging with dedication. Royd did not lag behind him, also selflessly digging until he sweated. The shovels only managed to throw the earth beyond the boundaries of their place of work. And so Royd swung his instrument so hard over his head, to lower it in front of you in the final movement. Both men stood outside the finished house, looking at the work as it finally reached its final point, with Royd celebrating with a shout of joy. John was pleased to announce to the world around him that the construction was complete. On the house in front of them there was only one hieroglyph unknown to Gabriel, and the man asked Royd what it meant, to which John replied that it was his logo. He turned to the servant with a sly grin, either asking or asserting that it was time for a check. Royd explained that it was time to check how much he had cheated the innkeeper with the agreement that Gabriel doubted. The servant only looked coldly at his master, without commenting on his question. When they called the innkeeper's family, a cold, dank wind was blowing around the house. But this did not prevent the heating system inside the house from working, nor did it prevent the logs from burning in the fireplace. The house was completely ready, heated from the outside, and a dense column of white smoke came from the chimney. Inside the house there was a very warm floor, on which the innkeeper's mother rolled joyfully, and the man himself could not get enough of the fact that he was in a warm place, not embarrassed by Royd and Gabriel looking at them. The innkeeper's mother, suffering from joint disease due to the cold, admitted that her body was fully rested on this warm floor. The innkeeper himself enthusiastically continued to feel the floor, not daring to believe that this was even possible. Royd simply watched the happy family, understanding what surprised them so much, and reasoning about it. After all, he just used a simple floor heating system, and for all the locals it was like magic. The innkeeper sincerely turned to Royd with gratitude, because he had not seen his mother smile for a very long time, and was glad that he could enjoy her joy again. Amazed by this, Gabriel remembered that at the very beginning of construction, Royd told him that the innkeeper and his mother would laugh, and these words came true. The servant continued to wonder what had happened, and why his master had changed in one morning so that now he did not recognize either the manner of speech or the expression on Royd's face. And in addition to everything, he also worked hard and fulfilled his promise to the innkeeper. Gabriel couldn't believe that Royd actually wanted to see the smiles of ordinary people, because Royd Frontera was not that kind of person. But the servant saw with his own eyes the happiness of ordinary people and how Royd devoted himself to work. I saw that the happiness of the innkeeper's family was real and was obtained not through deception, but through honest work, which made the servant himself happy with how everything turned out. Three blue information signs immediately appeared in front of Royd, informing him that the servant's interest level had increased by two points, and was now minus twenty-nine, 
and for the fact that his relationship with the main character had improved, he received as much as 36 RP. What he saw made Royd happy, because he worked well with Gabriel, and he liked the servant's company. The young master turned to the servant, asking if he still thought he was trash and insisting that he clearly did not, while Gabriel continued to claim that his opinion had not changed, but did not say it with enough confidence. Royd fell behind the servant, still smiling and assessing what was happening in his favor, because he had completed the first order, and although he was in a complete loss, it was not important at the moment. Not After all, the house that he built for free for the innkeeper will be his model object for advertising. And a few days later, a whole line lined up at the house, while Royd sat nearby and looked at the townspeople waiting to enter the house. A man with red hair came out of the model house sharing his enthusiastic impression and thoughts that he thought he could melt in this house, while the queue freezing outside questioned him incredulously. Roy did not waste time, using all his charm, immediately asking the person who had come out whether he was warm, and whether he would like the same room in his house, impatiently slapping the table. Roy had a plan, and he was already showing the man who had just come out two options on how to do this using two models, the first of which was the same as the innkeeper's separate house. And model B could be the reconstruction of the entire house, and if two were chosen models for the client would be a 10% discount. Ten Immediately, a blue sign appeared to remind Roy that the villager did not trust him, but this was not a problem for the guy, because he again used his insignificance ability to put pressure on the man. Roy asked if the townspeople believed him, focusing on the price, and using all his powers of persuasion when, besides the townspeople, someone else appeared nearby. These people who just arrived called out to Royd, distracting him from a profitable deal. It was Royd's father, Arcos Frontera, who was wondering what his son was doing here, and behind him stood a blonde man with a large mustache. Another information sign appeared in front of the man, informing him that his father's level of interest in him was minus 20. Royd, upset and taken by surprise, did not expect his father's visit, because it did not bode well. The Frontera family estate was beautiful and well kept on a clear day. In the living room, at opposite ends of the long dining table, designed for a large number of eaters, there were only two people sitting, namely Royd and his father. Royd wasn't thrilled about having lunch alone with his father. Looking at the man opposite, he thought about how diligently he avoided him, because if he forbade his son to build, Royd did not know what he would do. And Royd's father was the first to break the pause inviting his son to speak. The man looked at John suspiciously, asking what he had come up with this time. Royd was prepared for such a question, deciding to answer quickly and clearly within the framework of burish mode, reporting that the innkeeper placed an order for floor heating and Royd simply fulfilled it. The man could not be fooled so easily, because he already knew that his son continued to enter into agreements with other residents, which was suspicious. Arcos Frontera made a special emphasis in addressing his son on the fact that the residents were important and valuable to him, and he would not forgive if Royd lied to them or deceived them. Rod blithely continued to eat, asking his father not to worry, but he mentally noted again that once again they did not believe him. Having finished eating, Royd noted that he had nothing more to say to his father and was about to leave, mentally urging himself to run away faster. Arcos was not going to allow his son to leave so quickly because his motives were unclear to him, and the man suggested that Royd was going to help the locals, because he learned that their family was now in a difficult situation, because Royd could not be a fool and knew how to see, and hear, and draw conclusions. The man tried to convince his son that he could handle something as trivial as their problems, and Royd should not interfere. Royd turned around thoughtfully, realizing that he had already heard exactly the same words when he was John, in his previous life. In John's home world, his real father had already told him that everything was fine and he didn't have to worry, that nothing serious was happening and he could study. And John really thought that everything was in order, but now he understood that this was a lie, and neither then, in his former life, nor now in the life of Royd Frontera and his family, nothing was in order, and Arcos was lying to him. John was not going to become pathetic because of someone's filthy money, so he wished his father not to give up and he himself would not give up, but would try. As John left Arco's frontier, he knew these were the words he should have told his father from his home world. But already in the corridor, Royd's thoughts returned to the orders of his models, 
and the guy realized that Model A had been ordered from him 32 times, and Model B 57, and he even received half the deposit, which could solve the problems with money. It was because of these thoughts that he met two strangers in the corridors of the estate. Looking at them, John remembered that they were the moneylender Mitroff and the moneylender Salo, since they coincided with the description from the novel. These arrogant men passed by without even saying hello to Royd, which offended him, because in this estate he was not the last person, but the son of a baron. John didn't immediately remember why these men were even in their estate now. At this time, in his father's office, Arcos's conversation with the guests did not promise anything good. One of the moneylenders, a thin man Salo, sat imposingly on the baron's table, asking how long Arcos would delay the payment, and the plump moneylender Mitroff reminded that more than five days had passed. Mitroff threatened that he and his friend would stop tolerating the baron's inaction and the fact that he continued to delay payments, making Arcos nervous. John, remembering why the moneylenders returned, opened the door to his father's office, eavesdropping on how once again the moneylender Salo was pressing his father, offering to sell items from their estate so that money would appear. John realized that he had understood everything correctly and approached his father's office on time. Royd's evil, triumphant smile said that he had planned everything perfectly. When the guy was in his room, he again called up the information sign looking at the number of his RP points, which were 36. He wondered where he could use these points gained from improving his relationship with Gabriel. Then a new blue information board suggested that he could invest these points in talents, and this would improve his abilities, which John did not expect, because all previous similar explanations were confusing. The next sign that appeared said that since Roy did not value her, she would not explain, and he had to apologize. His words were accepted by the mysterious system, and the next tablet began to load. A blue glowing circle suddenly appeared under Royd's feet. He rose up through the guy's entire body, scanning him for abilities and determining that he had various knowledge, such as soil mechanics, technology, construction equipment. Scanning it further, the system discovered knowledge such as water supply systems, design of steel and concrete structures, and the highest level of engineering. The next information board was surprised that Royd knew so much and he wondered if she should really be evaluating him, and if this was someone alive who had a scholarship for good academic performance, and that's why she was so meticulous. The new information board stated that it was possible for John to improve his skills based on existing listed knowledge, such as surveying a base, which required 15 points, or designing a base, which also required 15 points. John carefully studied the information on the tablet, since he did not quite understand how skills improved. Since he had enough RP points for both improvements, the guy clicked on both parameters at once in the last information plate to improve both of them. A new notification with the name of the topographical survey skill, base, appeared at the same time the guy's eyes began to glow green, causing him to scream. Looking out the window with such glowing eyes, he looked at the world. Now he had access to a topographical survey of the area, and he could not believe that this was possible without GPS, and that now he could calculate everything just by seeing it with his own eyes, because the world, while his eyes glowed with the applied skill, was outlined by a grid with dimensions. When he activated the design skill, he was able to draw house designs right in front of him, which he was very happy about, because before that he had suffered in his home world, drawing this on a piece of paper, but now he could do it in the air right in front of him. After acquiring such skills, Royd sat thoughtfully on the bed, thinking that in the future, thanks to such abilities, it would be much easier for him, but would the help of Gabriel's servant alone be enough for him? John remembered the heavy equipment that was in his home world, and was upset that he did not have the ability to summon such here. Then, in response to his thoughts, another blue sign appeared, informing him that there was something in this world for summoning, which made John happy. A new information sign appeared in front of his face, causing surprise. The information on it said that in this world he had access to a random choice of phantom. Through the use of RP points, he could summon phantoms with different capabilities and different skills, and such a phantom partner would try for him in everything that John considered advertising games. Having once again carefully studied the sign, the guy still had questions when additional lines with information appeared at the bottom. The new part of the sign said that randomly selecting a phantom cost 50 RP points, and he could start right away. Royd was upset that he couldn't start now, 
because he had no points left. The guy wondered what the word phantom could mean in this world, because usually this could characterize huge animals of different sizes, whose strength could be equal to heavy equipment. Then Royd realized that he needed more RP points to be able to take advantage of this, and then he left the room to return to his father's office, gain the interest of the main characters and earn the missing RP. And so one of the moneylenders began to threaten his father, slamming his hand on the table. It was the fat man Mitrov, who stated that since Arcos did not have a penny, he could suggest a way. The moneylender smiled frighteningly, advising him to sell his wife and children to Arcos, which would allow the baron to get good money. Royd's father, amazed by what was said, angrily stood up from his seat. Arcos was clearly going to answer him with something else, but Royd, with a sack on his shoulder, interrupted their conversation by entering the room and putting his hand on Mitrov's shoulder in a friendly manner, reminding him that even if the guests are creditors, they are obliged to maintain the bounds of decency. The moneylender Mitrov jumped away from the guy who suddenly appeared, asking who he was. Arcos called his son by name, and the fat moneylender remembered Royd as the eldest naughty son, pointing out that it was clearly because of his bad manners that he interfered in the conversation of adults. Mitrov began to threaten Royd, trying to drive him out of the office, to which Royd intercepted the conversation, asking the moneylenders to show the invitation letter. Both moneylenders stared blankly at the guy, not understanding what he asked. Then Royd quoted the fundamental law of the kingdom, more precisely, Chapter 6, Article 3, which stated that all the aristocracy are subjects of the king and have the right to defend their interests. The guy looked sternly and warningly at the moneylenders, informing them that entering the residence of the aristocracy, which is their estate, without an invitation letter is considered an intrusion and this is contained in the law of the kingdom. Both moneylenders began to shout with one voice that Royd was talking nonsense, and they had never heard such a law. John acted like a fool and suggested checking the existence of such a law. He called loudly to his servant Gabriel, since he had left the door unlocked and he should have heard it. The sword servant actually appeared immediately, informing Roy that he was nearby. Gabriel entered the baron's office calmly and confidently, not surprised by the guests. John was determined. He smiled frighteningly when the servant entered and ordered him to cut off the hand of one of the intruders. The moneylenders immediately became nervous shouting that Royd had gone crazy and clearly wanted to sue them. John only grinned at such accusations and suggested that the moneylenders again check whether the law he referred to exists. He suggested that the moneylenders find out which side the court would take, while Gabriel drew his sword. The moneylenders were horrified that the swordsman was going to carry out the order of the baron's son. They rushed out of the office, threatening Royd with future problems, promising that he would regret it. Very quickly they disappeared from Arcos's office and only the slamming door indicated that they had even been here a second ago. Royd was pleased with himself as he saw off the escapees with a comment about how insignificant they were. Only his father did not share his son's satisfaction, turning to him and the servant who came. Arcos was desperately furious at his son's prank, sure that they did not understand what they had done, because, in his opinion, now there was a situation where they had to be on their knees and beg the moneylenders. But Royd did not pay attention to his father's words. With a loud thud he lowered the bag that he had been holding over his shoulders onto the table in front of the man. He smiled, telling the baron that at first he wanted to receive the entire deposit from the villagers and then give it to his father, but he changed his mind and gives what he already has so that his father will pay this month's interest. Arcos looked in disbelief at the bag containing the gold, clarifying that his son had collected money from the villagers, obtained in a dubious manner. Gabriel entered the dialogue unexpectedly siding with Royd and asking the baron not to worry. The servant promised that he would ensure that Royd fulfilled the terms of the contract. Arcos, looking closely at the servant, came to the conclusion that Gabriel looked as if he completely trusted Royd's words. Royd smiled, bowed to his father, as did Gabriel, and said that since he didn't mind the money, they would go. The sound of both men's footsteps echoed in the corridor. Gabriel was the first to start a dialogue asking how Royd knew such laws, because the servant was sure that he was a fool, to which the embarrassed John replied that he simply heard it somewhere. Mentally, he himself remembered how he learned about this in the novel, after the baron and his wife committed suicide. The same moneylenders that the baron now had, after his death, 
wanted to dig up the body of Arcos and his wife and sell it. And then Gabriel himself uttered words about the fundamental law of the kingdom, its third chapter, sixth article, that all the aristocracy were subjects of the king and had the right to defend their interests, which John now took advantage of. In the novel, Gabriel spoke these words before he cut the necks of the moneylenders, and then in court the servant was acquitted. Royd once again thought that he had a huge advantage, such as knowledge of the content of the novel and to the world of which he found himself. Pensive Royd not only remembered the contents of the novel, but also understood that a notification was due to arrive any moment now. And then several information signs appeared saying that the interest of Royd's father, Baron Arcos, has increased by six values. And since Royd has improved his relationship with the main character, he receives 60 RP, and his current amount of RP is 61. John smiled triumphantly, because everything happened as he planned, and now he will be able to activate the phantom. On a moonlit night, it was quiet and calm near the estate. John walked out onto the training ground alone, intent on putting his skills to the test now. He turned around, making sure no one was around before he started. Calling up the blue navigation sign in front of him, he selected the skill of freely drawing fantastic creatures. The inscription at the bottom of the sign said that the cost of activating this ability was 50 RP, and John pressed the start button. A bright neon green light immediately lit up somewhere in the sky above Royd. The sign disappeared and in front of him the guy saw several virtual gears that began to spin quickly. These gears moved bizarrely in the sky above Royd. The guy watched their movement in shock assuming that this is how magic works. Finally the gears came together into one big virtual seal. True, as soon as the drawing was completed, the seal shrank to the size of a human head and stopped in front of the disappointed Royd, because the guy decided that since the seal was so small, the spell was somehow weak. Nothing else happened to the seal, and strange, incomprehensible sounds were simply heard from its depths, until something inside it began to glow brightly. After a couple of moments, a small animal similar to a hamster crawled out from the center of the small virtual seal. Royd watched this in confusion and upset, because the guy was counting on a large phantom. The hamster fell at Royd's feet, falling on his stomach. He quickly stood up and joyfully looked at the guy with his small eyes. Royd looked at the animal at his feet with incomprehension, unable to find words to express his reaction. The guy looked at the animal contemptuously, concluding that something had gone wrong with the spell since there was such a small creature in front of him. This reaction upset the hamster, and his eyes filled with tears. He began shouting an incomprehensible word padom, which did not add clarity to Royd, because he did not understand what this small animal could do. The guy asked the animal what he could do, because the ability to shoot acorns would not be useful to him, and what else the hamster was capable of, Royd did not know, which he asked the animal again. The hamster began to live intensely for something, and his big cheeks were swollen, there was something in his mouth. Soon the animal spat out two pieces of paper, arousing Royd's disgusted curiosity. The guy squatted down, picking up and opening sheets of paper, reading on one that it was the Manual of Padom, which was the name of the hamster in this world. The instructions stated that Padom was a cute hamster, and should be cared for with love. The second bag contained sunflower seeds that should be fed to the Padom, and some of them could change the structure of the hamster. The instructions stated that the red sunflower seed made the padong grow huge, but the effect would wear off after 12 hours. The blue sunflower seed makes the padong small, and should be fed to it before the effect of the red seed ends. Royd also read in the instructions that a set of two seeds will cost one RP point. The guy looked at the animal with a question, thinking out loud about how big this animal could grow, whether it was only the size of a person or more, to which padong, shouting out his name, advised Royd to check for himself. Royd, remembering that hamsters drip well, decided that the padong could be useful, even if it became only the size of a person, so he fed the animal a red seed. Padong happily accepted the treat, instantly eating the offered seed. The transformation of the animal began immediately, and right before Royd's eyes, the padong began to rapidly increase in size. And the padong did it so quickly that Royd did not have time to dodge, and was knocked down by the animal. Since the hamster's transformation was very fast, the impact on Royd was so strong that he was sent flying several meters away. Stopping on the ground, the guy looked in shock at the huge beast. In front of him there was no longer a small hamster, but a 5 meter or even 10 meter long phantom padom. 
The huge hamster looked down on Royd, hoping that his owner was now pleased with his size. The blue information plate characterizing the animal said that the padong had the first level digging skill. Confirming this, the animal immediately dug a huge trench in the ground with lightning speed. The next information board reported that the padong had a level 1 ground fortification skill. Joyfully shouting his name, the huge hamster rolled along the dug trench, strengthening it with the strength of his large body. The new information board talked about the first level of puffing out the cheeks as another padong skill. The animal stopped and puffed out its huge cheeks, showing how it could. It turned out that he had a lump of earth in his mouth, which he immediately spat out in front of Royd. A huge compressed lump, abundantly covered with saliva so that it stained everything around, fell to the ground in front of the guy. Royd, not at all embarrassed by the abundance of the padong's saliva on the clod of earth that splattered him from head to toe, happily watched what was happening, because the padong could solve all his problems with heavy equipment. Already returning to his room along the corridors of the estate, Royd was thinking about how best to tell others about the padong, and was worried whether people would worry about the animal. He came up with the idea of simply carrying a summoning book with him and telling everyone around him that he was a brilliant summoner, and reassured by this thought, the guy sped up quite quickly. Quickly leaving for his place, he was already thinking about how to solve the problem with workers for the large-scale construction project that Royd had started. The earlier morning didn't take long to arrive. The weather was beautiful in the area around the village and estate. Royd gathered a group of identically dressed men in front of him and handed out shovels to everyone, beginning the briefing and ordering everyone to repeat important rules after him. First of all, he communicated that safety comes first, shouting it so that everyone can hear. In front of him stood the army of the Frontera Barony, consisting of 30 people who did not really understand what Royd was talking about yawning sleepily and asking again. Royd had to fight not to laugh as the soldiers in front of him answered inappropriately, as if they weren't being paid, and then Royd wondered, since his father had so many debts, why they were still maintaining these soldiers instead of disbanding them home. The guy thought that since they were so lazily obeying his words, and the Baron's financial situation was bad, he would not give these guys overtime bonuses, and since they were idle anyway, they could become an excellent workforce. Royd addressed the soldiers again, urging them to listen to him carefully, and reminding them that they were all soldiers, and together they were an army. He recalled that the essence of the army is to complete assigned tasks, while at the same time recalling his past, and his service in the army of his home world, where they spent more time digging and weeding than actually training. Royd provided the guys with a mountain of earth, saying that he dug it out, working all night. He kept silent about the fact that it was the merit of the padong that he managed it in half an hour, because this did not concern the soldiers. He turned to the guys, explaining that their primary task was to revive the estate, and they would implement his new project, and the soldiers needed to move this land to the construction site. Such a command did not generate support among the soldiers, who clearly did not want to work. Royd assumed that these people would react this way, but that was not the main problem. The guy was approached by someone who had just approached. It was the blonde man who, along with Royd's father, visited him in the village during the presentation of model houses to the locals, and it was the senior knight of the Frontera Barony, Newman, who wondered what Royd had ordered his people to do. But Royd was not surprised, because he had been waiting for the moment when Newman would speak. There were three knights in the Frontera estate, and the eldest of them was Newman, to whom Byron and the main character of the novel, Xavier Gabriel Azrahan, were subordinate. And now, standing next to Newman, John recalled that at the beginning of the novel, only Gabriel Byron and Xavier Arakan remained loyal to his family until the fall of the estate. And Newman was the first to betray and abandon the Baron, because it was he who sold information about the Baron to scammers. Royd looked at Newman with a look of contempt and incomprehension, wondering how such a disgusting person could be the senior knight of the estate. Pulling himself together, the boy slung the shovel over his shoulder, turning to Knight Newman and asking what he thought they were doing. The knight continued to glare at Royd, replying that he could not believe that the baron's son would force the militia to do his dirty work, and he, as the head of the knights, could not tolerate such a thing. Royd could only mentally roll his eyes at the nonsense that the knight was saying, because he was earning money to pay off his family's debts. But out loud the guy only said that he had the baron's permission. Newman, of course, did not believe in Royd's positive intentions, 
suspecting that he had somehow outwitted the Lord, and decided to remember the past of the Baron's young son. The knight assumed that Royd's intentions were selfish, and that he was using the militia for personal gain. Looking at the serene guy, Newman asked whether he was right or wrong. Royd confirmed with a calm smile that the knight was right, and then, with a serious, threatening face, he added that Newman would now receive a blow with a shovel. The knight in front of him clearly did not expect such pressure, because his endurance was weak, and his emotions expressed fear and fear, and Royd noticed that in an online game, if Newman had ever played them, his endurance would not have been enough for a real fight. Royd sharply stuck the shovel into the ground, scooping up part of it. Swinging, he threw sand in the knight's face, catching him by surprise. The guys from the militia watched what was happening in shock, clearly not expecting such a turn. Newman only managed to shield his hand from some of the lumps. Royd smiled smugly, because his prank was a success and the knight was frightened by his unexpected action. Newman stood covered in sand, dirty and humiliated. His face showed anger and indignation, and he turned to Royd calling him a scoundrel, and asking if he was trying to tarnish his reputation, mentally cursing the stupid son of a bankrupt baron. But Royd was not to be swayed, because this is exactly what he wanted, goading the knight and asking if he wanted to throw away his regalia and fight. The guy masterfully twirled the shovel in his hands, as if it were a weapon. Stopping her right in front of the knight's face, Royd challenged him. The guy asked with a grin if the knight was ready to try to fight him and have a duel. The angry and angry knight was in the highest stage of anger, reporting that Royd would regret this, clearly accepting his challenge. Gabriel, who learned about Royd's idea already at the estate, clarified whether he really intended to duel with Knight Newman in a month. The servant looked at the young master doubtfully, asking if he was confident in his victory. Royd, in his usual manner, began to copy the fool, at first denying the victory. He honestly admitted that he was just a lazy person, while his opponent was a knight who was called both a man of heart and a junior sword expert, and how would Royd be able to fight him? And clearly Gabriel asked this without thinking, but finally, Royd asked whether his servant could think at all, which clearly offended him. Gabriel had to try very hard not to grab his sword at that very moment. The servant looked at the mentally retarded-looking master, clearly not believing that he could suddenly throw dirt at Knight Newman and even challenge him to a duel, assuming that Royd wanted to be a scoundrel again, like before. Gabriel doubted that such an act by Royd could be connected with the idea of earning money, because he himself asked the Baron for a favor, and removed Gabriel from the conversation, and appointed the Knight Byron as a temporary manager, while he himself led a detachment of builders. Det the servant could not believe that Royd was not confident in this duel, and could not decide how to feel about it and because he continued to pretend to be carefree and pick his nose, Gabriel wanted to kill him. Wiping his hands and interrupting his servant's thrashing, Royd turned to Gabriel, as Knight Xavier, with a request to do something for him. The young master again made a fool's face and nonchalantly asked the servant to teach him how to use a sword. Gabriel looked at the guy in front of him and replied that he didn't want to do this. Royd made a disappointed and upset face, still copying the fool and asking why and the servant replied that the first reason was that his duty was to keep Royd safe. Gabriel then looked at the guy in front of him appraisingly, adding that the second reason was that Royd was like a sack, in the sense that if the sack was taught fencing, what would be even more dangerous to be near him, which Royd was offended by, and asked the servant speak more softly. And when Gabriel turned his gaze back to the master, he again clarified whether these were all the reasons why he did not want to teach him. After all, Royd had a plan and something to offer Gabriel, and he asked if the servant would agree to teach him fencing if he could deal with his insomnia in return. Gabriel swallowed, caught off guard that Royd was aware of his weakness. Royd enjoyed the surprise effect, remembering that he knew it because it was in the novel he was reading, and he also knew not only about insomnia, but also about its cause. In the novel Night of Iron and Blood, knights were divided by rank into four levels, the very first was the junior sword expert, the next was the intermediate sword expert, followed by the supreme sword expert, and the last was the sword master level. Xavier's level was the highest sword master, and he would soon reach the last level, and the reason for his insomnia was Gabriel's inhuman nerves, which were too sensitive. This was called the sword master syndrome, and Royd understood that not only did they know about it in the rural areas where they were, but Gabriel himself had no idea about it 
so he again clarified whether the knight in front of him would agree to such a deal, and in order to put pressure, Royd said that Xavier should not pretend that he does not know about any insomnia. Pressing on the fact that his lack of sleep was written on his face, Gabriel breathed a sigh of relief, relaxing slightly after Royd explained everything. He looked doomedly at the young master and reluctantly agreed to try to teach him, to which Royd immediately did not believe him and asked him not to give in to him. Gabriel smiled smugly, saying that he simply did not believe that Royd could cure his insomnia and would most likely fail, because the servant had tried many things to cope with it, ranging from cognitive behavioral treatment, herbal remedies, aromatherapy, special exercises, oriental medicine and things like that. However, Royd's method worked, Parr and Gabriel very quickly fell asleep on the rocking chair, hugging a pillow. The guy stood nearby smugly, admiring the result of his work and quietly telling himself that everything that Gabriel listed was nonsense, and he knew exactly how to cure the servant's insomnia. Royd remembered that in the book, Gabriel accidentally fell asleep for the first time while studying magical techniques, so he himself took a similar approach reading the 18th magical technique to the servant about a manual on reinforced concrete structures. Or, grinning gloatingly, Roy triumphed, mentally rejoicing that since he succeeded, now all the skills of a swordsman will go to him. Their first training session began early in the morning. A perfect-looking Gabriel announced the first exercise, telling Roy to run 50 laps. Roy calmly looked at the servant and turned to proceed. Gabriel looked at him in surprise, mentally surprised that he ran without complaining. Royd, meanwhile, ran the first lap, and as he ran past Gabriel, he began to whine miserably, saying that he wanted him to teach him something. However, he did not stop and ran further, and when he ran past the servant, he sarcastically asked whether he expected Royd to run at all, and probably thought that he would whine. After the next circle, Royd continued that then Gabriel would have said that the master simply could not do this, and would have brushed him off, since Royd, with his words, got right into Gabriel's thoughts, he stood amazed. Running further, the guy shouted to the servant that he should figure out what he would do next, because Royd was going to run to the end. The blue information sign that appeared in front of him informed Royd that his passive skill of ugliness had been increased to the fourth level and now everyone who sees him would mistake him for an abnormal person and would feel the urge to punch him to which the guy was indignant that he had there is no such skill in wishing the notification to disappear. Each step was not as easy for Royd as it might seem, and mentally the guy already admitted that he was tired, and to say otherwise would not be true. Moreover, such a life was nothing in comparison with his memories of life in the real world, where he did not have a family that could give him warmth. Every morning he opened his eyes in a crowded dormitory, Every day he carried bricks on his back to the fourth floor of the villa. Every night he worked as a loader, loading trucks with boxes just to avoid starvation, living with the hope that one day things would get better. He encouraged himself to hold on, John, because one day he would get better, hoping for light at the end of his dark tunnel of life. He encouraged himself that he was doing well and being qualified, mentally reaching out to a brighter future. I believe that there was only a little time left before this hope arrived. I believed to the last, but the hope was not justified and not justified, and the bright future moved further and further away from him, and in the end he was left alone in pitch darkness. Therefore, in comparison with those oppressive feelings of real life, that pain and despair, Gabriel's training, his suffering right now was nothing, and Royd ran the next lap, assigned by Gabriel, without whining or giving up. Gabriel, looking at how he was driving himself to exhaustion, sincerely dedicating himself to training, decided that he would help the young master and teach him his fencing technique. A new series of blue information signs informed Royd that Xavier's opinion of him had improved by one point, and was now minus twenty-eight, and for this slight improvement in his relationship with the key character, he received eighteen RP points, and now his RP score was twenty-nine RP points. At this time, at night, an important conversation between Newman and Baron Frontera took place on the estate. Royd's father could not understand how his son could be so rude to Newman, who had protected their family for five generations. The Baron was upset by the news of the duel, because he thought that Royd had come to his senses, but after this news he thought that he apparently misunderstood his son's motives. However, the father informed the knight that his moral duty required him not to interfere with the duel, but he could not help but ask the knight, 
since his son was the heir to the estate, not to be too cruel to Royd. The baron asked the knight not to maim his son, but simply to bring him to his senses with this duel. Newman bowed his head obediently, saying that he accepted his master's request. But Newman was not honest with the baron, because in his mind he was already wondering whether he could and would want to do this during a duel. Walking angrily through the corridors of the estate, Newman, on the contrary, mentally imagined how he would beat the arrogant scoundrel Royd, and then simply kill him. The knight also decided that if the baron made a scandal out of this, that Newman would also kill him along with the baroness, and then pass it off as suicide, and then, as he had long planned, he would leave this village for a better place. Newman mentally rejoiced that thanks to this trick of the young scoundrel, these events would happen much faster than the knight expected, which made him very happy. A month passed and the day of the duel between Newman and Royd arrived. A lot of people gathered around the training field, and Newman with a sword and Royd with a shovel stood in the center. Sitting on the podium, Royd's parents and two knights waited with bated breath for the upcoming fight. Newman unfastened his sword and scabbard from his belt, grabbing it for convenience and turned to Royd, asking if he was ready. Royd kicked the edge of the heavy metal shovel and threw it over his shoulders, answering with a smile that he was ready. The young gentleman was full of confidence and self-satisfaction, saying that Newman should prepare to receive a shovel. The crowd of spectators looked at Royd in surprise, not understanding why he chose a shovel, not believing that he seriously decided to fight Knight Newman with a shovel. Newman himself looked back with displeasure, humiliatingly assessing the shovel in the hands of his opponent. Gabriel, standing on the podium with Royd's parents, also looked at the young master's shovel, remembering that it was made of metal and Royd ordered it from a blacksmith. Royd's father, meanwhile, lamented that his son was an idiot, suggesting that for him it could all seem like some kind of joke. Gabriel wondered if Royd could really take everything as a joke, and came to the conclusion that he couldn't, remembering what his master had been doing for the last month. The servant saw Royd strenuously doing general exercises early in the morning. During the day, his master went to the construction site to explain to the village engineers about the boiler room. In the evening, Royd returned to Gabriel, and they trained with the sword until the guy wanted to sleep. After analyzing all this, the swordsman decided that his master did not seem like a man who was just joking, and Gabriel was sure that Royd was serious. Royd's father raised his hand, calling everyone to silence and announced that the duel between Royd Frontera and Knight Newman would begin right now. Newman thrust his sword forward, taking a fighting stance. Royd grabbed the shovel with both hands and also took a stance, only she didn't look serious at all. Gabriel watched this in amazement complaining that his master had taken such a stupid pose, not at all like a fighting one. Newman attacked with the first sharp swing of his sword, allowed indignant that Royd had mocked him with such neglect in the duel. Royd was completely focused on the fight, holding the shovel tightly in front of him. He confidently repulsed the knight's attack, standing still. Gabriel and Baron Frontera watched the fight in surprise. Newman thought Royd had just gotten lucky as he swung for his second strike. But the baron's son not only did not suffer from this blow, but also repelled it with his shovel, redirecting the knight's sword in the other direction. Gabriel watched his master's movements in amazement, realizing that he had just used an incredibly effective technique, using a special technique that is used in real battles, and the servant could only note in amazement that this was evidence of a sharp improvement in Royd's sword skills after so many years years of no progress. Royd, meanwhile, again pointed the shovel at Newman, who was surprised by his speed. Mentally, the guy laughed at the confusion of the knight in front of him, remembering that in his native country every man could handle a shovel like that. Royd remembered his real life, where he was trained during his military service in this modern hand-to-hand -hand combat technique called the bayonet charge. Returning to the battle, the guy mentally reminded himself that the shovel in his hands can do a lot making another lunge towards the knight who barely had time to dodge with a shameful cry. Royd used his weapon not only as an attack weapon, but also as a shield, deflecting blows from Newman's sword. Another attack from Royd, which he called the power of cutting off roots, and the shovel passed very close to the knight, who barely managed to dodge again. A sudden thought that visited the baron's son forced him to stick a shovel into the ground and do something that no one expected from him. The guy stood on the shovel with both feet and, springing, began to jump on it with a mad scream, disorienting his opponent. Gabriel, who was sincerely worried about Royd, 
fearfully thought that his master was joking again. But Royd had no time for jokes, because he was about to attack. Gabriel, appreciating his concentrated and satisfied face, once again began to doubt his master's motives. At that moment, Newman, with a victorious cry, rushed with his whole body to attack his opponent. Royd was ready for such a turn, because the shovel was only the first weapon that the guy prepared to beat his opponent. Royd's second weapon was the basics of fencing, which he learned from Xavier, and using them, the guy carried out a series of attacks, forcing his opponent to retreat. Amazed by the speed and force of the Baron's son's blows, Newman began to doubt that he had correctly assessed his opponent, because Royd had always been a drunkard and a scumbag, and the knight could not understand when he became so strong. Royd used the third weapon that he prepared for this duel with Newman. It was a synchronized skill in handling tools, or rather digging of the first level, which allowed him to become one with the shovel and soul and body, thanks to which the level of synchronization between him and the shovel only grew. He swung his shovel, which glowed green with a skill activation, preparing to strike. Royd remembered how he was able to get RP points for this, because his training increased Gabriel's opinion of him by a full point. In addition, the Baron and Baroness, who for the first time in their lives saw the sincerity of their son, also improved their opinion of him by two and three points, respectively. Therefore, he was able to accumulate 97 RP points, and the blue information sign suggested that he learn the additional digging skill, which cost only 40 RP points. When Royd agreed and mastered this skill, he realized that he was quite cool. And now, during the battle, he competently used it to confront the knight. Newman was exhausted because Royd was too good at countering him. The knight concentrated, swinging his sword, mentally deciding that he had no choice because he was going to use a technique that was not usually used against ordinary people. He clenched his sword, activating the special skill he was going to use to defeat Royd. Gabriel, who noticed this, only narrowed his eyes slightly, clearly not expecting this from the knight, but without looking frightened. The power of the skill, called mana, began to concentrate in Newman's body. It flowed from his arms and legs to the center of his chest, twisting into a spiral in the area of his heart. Royd, ready for anything, realized what was happening, because his opponent was pumping up with mana. The guy knew that this skill was called a mana heart, and Newman was clearly going to use it against him. The knight stood up and raised his sword in front of him. He looked menacingly at the baron's son, saying that everything was serious now, and called his opponent a bastard. Royd remained silent, only clutching the shovel tighter and not showing fear. Newman swung and rushed towards him, intending to deliver a crushing blow. Gabriel carefully watched the unfolding battle, mentally analyzing that Royd, who had no talent for ten years, would have needed at least five years to master such a technique as the Heart of Mana, and it was unlikely that he would be able to block such an attack now. Royd, meanwhile, calmly remained standing in place, ready for the knight to strike. He just raised his weapon in front of him, either intending to repel the attack, or intending to use the shovel as a shield. Newman mentally triumphed, considering him an idiot, planning with his blow not only to cut the shovel, but also to pierce the guy's skull. Royd's mother, Maria, covered her mouth with her hands in fear, holding back a scream, and his father rose from his seat, worried about his son. Knight Newman's crushing blow struck the core of the shovel. But what the knight expected did not happen, and the shovel survived. On the contrary, instead of the effect of defeat, Newman felt that all his strength seemed to begin to flow away. Royd smiled maliciously, mentally remembering the fourth weapon, which was the skill that the guy prepared specifically for the duel with the knight. Gabriel calmly continued to watch the duel, while Royd recalled that it was thanks to the servant that he was able to master the skill of mana, because it was this skill that made Xavier the strongest man in the novel. This was Azrakan's core technique, which, when used, could transfer mana from one opponent to another during a fight. Newman pulled back his sword, retreating and exclaiming in horror that his mana had been drained. Royd did not wait for his opponent to come to his senses and swung for another blow. He hit Newman with a shovel right in the face with all his might. The knight only saw the tooth fly over him against the blue sky. I saw it, but because of the blow I didn't immediately realize that it was his tooth. Royd, again preventing Newman from coming to his senses, hit him in the jaw with the handle of a shovel, and he swung for the next finishing blow from top to bottom. His shovel hit Newman squarely on the back of the head, knocking out any hope of victory. With a loud sound, 
the knight fell to the ground like a bag of sand. The public, shocked by such a turn, was surprised to not understand what had happened. Royd's father also did not expect this, because he was sure that Newman's blow would kill his son, but Gabriel was calm. The spectators began to whisper in bewilderment, not believing that the young master had won, because it seemed to them nonsense and a very strange coincidence of circumstances. Baron Frontera, with slight hesitations and pauses, slowly and loudly announced that his son, Royd Frontera, had won the duel. Newman, who was lying defeated on the ground, could not believe the Baron's words, not believing that a sword master like him could lose to such scum as Royd. The young gentleman approached his opponent, who was lying on the ground, clarifying whether Newman had heard this exactly, repeating that he had won the duel. Royd looked down on his opponent, proudly throwing a shovel over his shoulder, reminding him that he had been beaten with a shovel, and the guy was not going to stop there, swinging again and informing Newman that now the long-awaited punishment awaits him. The shocked toothless knight looked with fear at his victorious opponent. Royd's father, seeing that his son, despite the end of the duel, was again swinging the shovel, as if about to hit the knight lying on the ground, shouted that the duel was already over, not realizing with horror what Royd was going to do to him. The guy, as if maddened by adrenaline and the fight, showered Newman, who was crouched in a protective position, with a hail of shovel blows. The Baron, angry and horrified, shouted his son's name again in an attempt to stop him. 